You're listening to XVGM Radio. Welcome to XVGM Radio, where the bits keep coming. I'm Justin. And I'm Mike. And this is episode 74, Spy and Espionage Games. I'm actually really pumped for this episode. It's got tons of really amazing music, and it's a topic that I I don't want to say like, oh, we, you know, not a lot of people are talking about it, but like, it's kind of one of those topics that people cover specifically, like specific Metal Gear or Perfect Dark or, you know. Yeah, that, that, that's what I was going to say, too. Like, generally, you get the the, the, the more narrowed-down version. Uh, it doesn't go quite as uh, general as, as we did. And I, I think we found some really good stuff. It's not a genre that I'm actually super familiar with outside mm-hmm. of the really popular titles. So it was really cool to kind of find some of these other titles that are interesting, silly in, in some ways. Mm-hmm. This is This is going to be really funky. Yeah, agreed. A lot of different types of music, too. Like, some stuff that we found here, I was like, what is this? Like, I can't even believe this is in a spy espionage game. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll get into the music in just a moment. Just want to start the top of the show off with a gentle reminder that we have added a new Patreon tier for those of us uh, no longer on the go, not not traveling quite as much, not as much time to listen to a, an hour and a half, two hour or more show about video game music. Oh, so for $7 a month on Patreon, if you want to subscribe to that, uh, you will get monthly XVGM light episodes where it's just the music and just us introducing the tracks. Mm-hmm. Uh, none of the fluff, none of the banter or any of that other stuff that you may not have as much time to listen to anymore. So um, yeah. obviously everyone will still get this show for free, but if you would like a more condensed version, we are offering that through our Patreon. Yeah, it's basically an added bonus that we're giving. It's something that we have to do a little bit more extra work to put out. So because of that, we are only going to be doing it for Patreon tier $7 and up. Now, here's the thing. If you sign up for the, if you're a dollar tier Patreon member, or if you're not even subscribed to the Patreon, if you sign up for it, you you don't just get that. You also get to play a track. You get to pick Patreon picks. uh, You get to choose patreon pick episodes uh that we do a couple times a year and you also get to pick music for certain shows as well like we will try to you know make you as as much part of the community as we can that we're that we've been trying to build so it's not just hey do i want like a diet or a light version of the show and that's all you get for seven bucks that would be crazy so you are getting additional stuff we'll hit you up every now and then for a track for a specific episode you could leave a testimonial you could tell us why you picked the track etc etc so if you are currently subscribed to it it's and it's a cool no to kind of add on as it you know if, if you just don't have time to listen to the mainline episode so hopefully uh you know if you're interested cool otherwise if not this is the last time we're going to mention it on the show we just wanted to put it out there and let everybody know about it so that way they that way it's it's out there in the open yeah so if you want to know more about it just go to patreon.com 
slash XVGM radio and take a look at what's there. They yeah. the, even the lower tiers have some really cool stuff. And uh, whatever tier you, you go for, you get all the stuff for the lower tiers as well. So, yeah. And I mean, dollar tiers alone get access to a whole nother episode every single month, a themed yep. episode that's exclusive to Patreon members. Nobody else gets that but Patreon. So pretty cool. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> so so Sl- Sly Spy is the name of the game that we came in on. Sly Spy Secret Agent. That was the 1989 release that came out in arcades. And uh, it's also was ported recently to the arcade archives as part of the Switch. Uh, so you can you can get it there. I don't know if it's on PS4 or not. I know it's definitely on Switch. It goes on sale pretty frequently too. So if you want to keep an eye out for it, you might be able to find it for like three bucks. The stage track that we heard was from Stage 4 and 7. And it's by Azusa Hara and Hiroaki Yoshida. What did you think about this one? This one was kind of neat. I was listening to it without looking at our notes here, and the first thing I thought was Genesis. So like, it mm. just it sounded very Genesis to me in a good way, and I was like, oh, this is really cool. I, I, I'm, I'm not even aware of what this game is, and I went back and looked, and I was like, oh, it's an arcade game. Okay, and I mean, the, the year sounds about right. 1989, they're probably using similar sound chips as to what the... Genesis was using, so it makes sense. But it was it was really cool. Like I get a I get very much like a cave or cavern feeling from like the main sort of loop there. It just mm. feels kind of like empty and echoey. Um, yeah. But even with like the main melody in there, like it, you get this sense of danger. So I, I don't know if it specifically reads spy, but I de- I know that with the spy thought in the back of my head, like this felt uh, it it felt appropriate. I agree there. So the, one of the reasons why you're you're hearing Genesis is because it is a Yamaha sound chip. There's a couple of different Yamaha sound chips on this one. It's the Yamaha YM2203 and also the YM3812. There is also an OKIM6295 in the sound chip for the Sly Spy arcade game, but that's the reason why you're hearing Genesis because that's the YM2612 that's in the Genesis. So it's very, it's got that very crunchy kind of warble to the bass. It's got the, that part where it's like, bo- 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 like yeah, that sustained yeah. kind of, you know, sustain and bend in the bass, like really cool. I love that sound. And then later on, like the beginning of the track sounds very spy-ish, but then you get this really nice jazz flow to it with a ba na da that like <laughs> 70s sly spy kind of secret agent vibe that they're going for. It's, it's a really nice touch and it brings out so much more in the track that wouldn't normally be there if they just stuck with that like more sinister creepy crawly sound to it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Sly Spy Secret Agent is kind of like if you took Bad Dudes and made it like about a secret agent, which makes sense because I believe it is by the same Data East team as far as Sly Spy goes. It was developed and published by Data East. And this game, the, the rights to it were bought by G-Mode, back in the uh, d- in the days of Data East bankruptcy back in 2003. So G-Mode got it and they decided to work with Arcade Archives to uh, put it back out. It's been on collections too. Sometimes it goes by Secret Agent, other times it goes by Sly Spy, but I believe in Japan, it's specifically known just as Secret Agent. So you may see on different collections in Europe, it's known as Sly Spy Secret Agent specifically, but uh, yeah, it's it's basically like the Timothy Dalton Bond era as far as like the visuals, like he kind of looks like Timothy Dalton, you know, like a dark haired, you know, heavy eyebrowed, you know, James Bond, you know, there's blonde babes everywhere and you know that you're you you got all kinds of crazy james bond references uh there's a golden gun reference there's a part where you're in the sea and you're swimming and it's it's more like a like an underwater shmup or something like that if i recall i think he's like trying to save the president's daughter or daughters i think yeah i don't know one of the composers on that you said was azusa hara who yeah. started out doing music composition with Shackled in 1986 mm-hmm. uh, and worked on a number of really cool games. They did sound effects on Robocop in 1988. They did sound on Bad Dudes in 1988 as well. Most of their credits are actually sound. They also did music in Heavy Barrel in 1987. Their last game was sound for Boulder Dash in 1990. 
And then Hiroaki Yoshida, also a Data East composer. Uh, they started off with Wonder Planet in 1987, uh, Midnight Resistance, they did the arcade port in 1989, Heavy Smash in 1993. They've done a bunch of stuff for Data East. And then they kind of moved over and did some stuff for Nintendo with the DK series, Don Donkey Kong Barrel Blast, DK Jungle Climber in 2007, both of those, uh, Glory of Heracles in 2008. Their latest game, they actually returned back to spy stuff. They actually are credited for voice talents for Tom Clancy's The Division 2 in 2019. As far as like compositions go though, they really kind of moved over to sound direction for years. Mm -hmm. So the last composition or sound credit I could find was back in 1996 for Magical Drop 2. Yeah, yeah. Or Winter Heat in 97. I'm not sure which, but <laughs> it's also worth noting that this game got a port to like the Amiga and like a bunch of other home systems. And uh, the reason why we're not m listing those here for this version is because those actually have a soundtrack by Tim Fallon. Oh. So totally different music and obviously more like, probably more like progressive rock-ish <laughs> that standard Tim Fallon sound. Yeah. Nice, yeah. nice. Yep, yep. Let's get into your first pick. I'm, I'm excited to hear this one because it's from a game that I've never heard of. Oh, <laughs> me either until I went looking. So this game is going to be Jazz Punk, which came out in PCs in 2014 and then on PS4 in 2016. The track is called Cyberpunk Chase, and it was composed by Luis Hernandez. <laughs> Thank you. 
right. That was Cyberpunk Chase off of the game Jazz Punk, which was released on PCs in 2014 and the PS4 in 2016. And it was composed by Luis Hernandez. Uh, and just to get this out of the way, uh, Luis Hernandez did most of the work on this game, uh, including directing uh, and production, design, writing, arts and graphics, and audio. Uh, this was a game published by Adult Swim Games, uh, mm. and it was basically a solo project by Lewis, and this is the only game on Lewis's resume, so okay. get, get that out of the way up front. Word. So, what did you think of this one? Uh, you know, I'm going to be honest, I don't know how to feel about this one. <laughs> I Initially, I really liked the crunchy, thumping kind of bass line that was going on with it. And I liked that like spidery kind of digga 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 digga. It felt like a spider walking, and so that sneaky kind of vibe definitely crept in here. But overall, I feel like the song went on for too long. There are two types of people that listen to a track like this and formulate opinions. There's <laughs> people that will sit here and be like, "I could vibe out to this all day." And then there's other people like me who are like, this doesn't change enough for me to enjoy it. So it's one of those things where it's like, I don't dislike it, but I don't, like, I wouldn't give it a second listen. I wouldn't listen to it again. I wouldn't actively go out and find it and put it on my phone. And like, you know, it's it's one of those songs that like, just has me kind of being like, Ugh, I just wish this would change a little bit more. And it doesn't seem to. And I even turned it off at one point early before the song ended because I was just like, I feel like I've heard everything that this song needs to put out. And, and, I, and I honestly worried like, or wondered, I honestly wondered, was this a song that was actually only like a 30 second loop, but it ended up getting, you know, jumped to like that three minute mark by the composer? I don't know. No, that that's uh, that, that's a fair assessment. That's also kind of what I thought you were going to say, because <laughs> we are. Well, no, I mean, not. I'm not talking bad about you. Oh no, I, no, I no, like no. That, no. I know. That's that, that. That's just kind of how we are. Like I'm the guy who's who's gonna say like I could totally vibe out to this song. Exactly. And you're the guy that's gonna go. Uh, I, I wish it did more. And yeah. it, it wasn't really until like when we started listening to it now that like I, I was getting into it and I was like, oh no. I just realized Mike's going to hate this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't hate it. I just, I wanted it to do something else. That's all. Yeah. And, and so these types of tracks are just, I don't want to be a stick in the mud regarding them because I do think that what they have here is good. I just don't think it's three minutes good. I think it's 30 seconds good. Right, and and I and I can totally get that. Like w the the first almost minute of the of the track actually doesn't really change up much at all. And mm. e even I was was looking at the timer, going like, I'm pretty sure this does something else. <laughs> and then like just as I was starting to think that, then like something else came in, and I was like, Oh, that's right. Okay. Cool, yeah, cool. yeah. Uh, and then like I I was just good for the rest of it. I forgot how kind of like minimalist and and repetitive it uh, it actually was. Mm. So. Overall, I think that's pretty fair. Um, yeah. I, I enjoyed it, and I, th I think our, our listeners are going to be fairly similarly split. Like, there's going to be people that, are, people that are just like, "Well, I'm glad he got that out in the beginning of the show," and some, some <laughs> are going to be like, "Oh, that was really neat." Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> word. But either way, uh, so jazz punk is a game that I am not familiar with. I, I found it completely by chance, and I <laughs> really want to find it and like for real and play it because it sounds mm. incredibly silly. It, as I said, it was published by Adult Swim Games, so if that tells you anything, it tells you that it, this is not just a straight-up, like, serious spy story. It's, right. It's going to be super It's a little goofy. on the silly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a single-player, first-person uh, adventure game. Uh, the focus is more on, like, exploration uh, and, like, the, com the, the comedy that's in the game over things like puzzle solving. Uh, you are a top-secret espionage agent who was just shipped to a... Uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Normal. Wait, normal? Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. You arrived at this agency uh, in a like human-sized package. The world of the game is is kind of funky. It's like a late 1950s uh, sort of retro futuristic, uh, which is kind of common in like cyberpunk type stuff. Hmm. Uh, alternate reality where Japan has conquered most of North America hmm. uh, and a good chunk of the game takes place in the in the country of Japanada. Oh, okay, so Japan and Canada combined? 
Yep. Okay, then. <laughs> I don't so. know how in the world that would work since they're pretty far apart, but okay. Yeah, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I just think of it like San Franco... Uh, San, San Francisco? <laughs> San Francisco. <laughs> Have you seen Big Hero 6? No. That That's the name of the, the, the city. It's, it's a combination of San Francisco and Tokyo. San Francisco sounds like a really fancy... Uh, uh, soy sauce that you would put on rice aroni. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I might try that. Yeah. But yeah, so there there's a number of missions in the game and the the missions are all kind of wacky and it, 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 yeah, it actually relies more on like free association and like references to like old video games and old movies to, to get around than anything mm. else like uh, there, there are things like you have to uh, degauss and smuggle pigeons <laughs> um, <laughs> you need to kill a pig with a ukulele um, nice. there, there, there's one portion where you need to get by a security scanner, and there's a couple ways to do it. You can, uh, you can photocopy your butt to fool the security scanner, or you can take a picture of the wall and hold it in front of you so that it, it does, it thinks that it's still looking at a wall. <laughs> it's, That's awesome. Yeah, like this game sounds hilarious. Wow. Uh, and I just. I totally missed it. That's pretty cool. That's a good find. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, the the soundtrack on this game is all is about as wacky as you might expect. Like it does not all sound like this. Okay. The, this track was the one that I that I personally thought was the coolest. Mm-hmm. So there, there's a number of other uh, other tracks here. Other things titled uh, things like Monster Truck, uh, mm-hmm. Pirate Keygen, uh, Egyptian Music Sting, uh, Creepy Taxes, <laughs> Porn Music. Uh, <laughs> Oh boy! And then we'll just go with Wave Race. Nice. So there, there, there's some really funny stuff on here. Cool. That's pretty wacky, and I would mm-hmm. expect nothing less than uh, than that from Adult Swim. So it yeah. makes sense. Seriously. Yeah. Speaking of wacky, let's move into my first pick. It's Spy versus Spy, but this is the Game Boy Color port, which has a little bit different music than the. Uh, than the originals on like NES and like and the 8-bit uh, computers that came out like in Europe. This is the 1999 release. The track is called BGM04 or Rocket Ship Stage and it's by an unknown composer.
Hey, you're back. Thanks for joining us back on our episode 74, Spy Espionage Games, where we just played a track from Spy vs. Spy. This came out in the Game Boy Color in 1999, and this track specifically was called BGM-04, also known as the Rocket Ship Stage, and it's by an unknown composer. So this is a remake of the old Spy vs. Spy game, and uh, it came out on the NES, but uh, it, it also was released on like uh, Atari mm. and you know yeah there a were a lot bunch of, of a lot of ports of it tons of ports but we're only mentioning this one specifically regarding in the uh, the show notes and everything because like I couldn't find this version of this song anywhere else hmm. and again unknown composer I couldn't even I looked in the game's credits couldn't find anything like there were no credits at the end of the game so I I just couldn't find any information on the composer so not much to talk about there it was released by Kemco. It's a pretty fun tune. I like how lighthearted it sounds. <laughs> it, it almost has like a Snoopy, like Peanuts, Charlie Brown kind of vibe to it. Like a like a two-step, da -na 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 -na, da -da -na -na. like you could really bob your head while listening to this one. Yeah, no, I agree. It's actually one of the things that I that, that I jotted down here is it sounds brighter than I would actually expect for a Spy vs. Spy game. I have played the one for the NES, but I haven't played it in so long that I really don't remember what the music sounds like. Uh, mm. And that that's funny because I, I was originally thinking of picking a Spy vs. Spy NES track for this episode. Right. I wouldn't I wouldn't expect it to sound quite this bright. Uh, and then mm. the other thing that uh, that kind of threw me off is there's a riff in this track that reminded me of something else. And I, I was racking my brain for it. I had to pause the song and kind of like sing it to myself. And then I realized, oh, it reminds me of a Mega Man track. Like, I, I, I think it's oh. I think it's Mega Man 2. But there's. OK, so Dr. Wiley's song, uh, theme a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you sped it up. Yeah, yeah, like it's, it's da, 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 definitely da, 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 not exact by any means. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you added in some, I think they're called like tremolos or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. It it reminded me of that, and like once once I was able to pinpoint that, it, you know, I was able to like move past it. But yeah, mm. it, this is this is a cool little track. I I was surprised by what I heard. Yeah, yeah, it's it's lighthearted and fun. It's got a nice sweet kind of melody to it, mm. so it was it was cool to listen to. Game wise, uh, again, this is Spy vs. Spy. So if you've ever played it on like the NES, it's it's basically a remake of of that. It doesn't really stand out graphically. Uh, like it's kind of flat graphically as far as the colors and everything. Everything's really bright, and the yellows are really yellow, and the blues are really blue, like those sort of uh, colors. But in Spy vs. Spy. It is a uh, Mad Magazine character where one one of them is dressed like a, a black black like covered in black uh, spy, and then the other one is dressed in white. You know, you either play as one or play as the other. <laughs> you have different missions that you have to complete. There's four different areas. There's stealth jet, there's speedboat, there's rocket ship, and spy car. Mm. And each one of those areas has eight different levels. And uh, as you play along with those levels, like, you know, they get harder and harder and everything. The point of the game is you have to grab a hidden briefcase and then you have to put four different items that you find in it. So the items can be found hidden throughout the rooms of each stage. And once you find those items, you put them in the briefcase and then you have to try to exit to uh, complete the mission. And if the other spy finds you, he attacks you and uh, knocks you out. And uh, then, you know, you have to, you know, try to start again. So there's all different bombs and traps and different things that uh, you will come across as well. There's a little in-game map as, as well. So it's pretty cool. It's a neat little concept. I'm going to have to try to see if I can find this one. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive, I believe. There is also a version of this game uh, that came out on the Game Boy, and I think it's called like Operation Booby Trap, and I think that one is more directly inspired by the NES and the 8-bit uh, the hmm. computer games. So um, you could always go for that one too, but I, I, I'm going to be honest, I heard both soundtracks, and I loved this one over that one, so I'd go with this one. Nice, nice. Yeah. So I guess we can address whatever Janine is doing right now. Uh, yeah. She's waving her her tentacles, what? her Metroid-like tentacles. What is she holding? Is that is that a cassette tape? I think do we, so. Do, I don't even know how she got a cassette. Do tape. we even have a way to play? Cause oh, oh, I I guess we do. Okay. 
Um, so. Okay, let's, Janine, why don't you pass that over and let's, let's see what she has to share. Yeah. XVGM Radio, this is <laughs> HQ, patron code name, Chris Hart. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to play the main theme to the 2000 video game, The Operative, No One Lives Forever. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. Five seconds? That's not a lot of time to react. Yeah, what is... Whoa! Uh, okay, well, I guess... That just exploded. Yeah, I, I, I guess we can't play cassette tapes anymore. I guess not, so nobody better send us in cassette tape requests, I guess. <laughs> what a what a fun way to do a Patreon request. So. Yeah. Hey, Janine, can you uh, fire extinguisher, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, so let's uh, go ahead and play Chris's request, Chris Hart's request, No One Lives Forever, which came out on the PC in 2000 and the Mac in 2002. This track is called Main Title, and it's by Guy Whitmore. Welcome back. That was The Operative, also known as No One Lives Forever, and that came out on the PC in 2000 and the Mac in 2002. The track was Main Title, and it's by Guy Whitmore. Thanks to Chris for selecting this track. It's uh, it's really fun and, and just very relaxing at the same time. It's got that great 60s spy vibe. I was kind of half expecting a little, like, wiki guitar to go to come in like a wick, 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 you know but it was it was good stuff it's more like 60s vibe than that like 70s vibe but uh it's like everything about this screams james bond and as we talk about the game you'll you'll see that 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 makes a lot of sense <laughs> yeah i i got i got the same sort of feelings off of it although to me it reminds me of something kind of that it sits halfway between you know, james bond and austin powers okay I could see that. I could totally see that, actually. I mean, I, I think this game is is itself kind of sits between those two uh, as well, because from what I understand, like I'm not super familiar with this game, but from what I understand, it is like a spy game set in the '60s. It's very stylized, and it it, do, it does have some humor aspects to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I I think the game itself is kind of between James Bond and Austin Powers too. So yeah, for sure. I, I think I really think like right around this time there was a pretty heavy focus on games having that like 60s 70s kind of James Bondy kind of vibe there's a lot of games that were coming out with that kind of style uh Vigilante 8 there was Austin Powers games that were coming out around that time and the Starsky and Hutch game that came out too right around this time so you know oh, yeah. 70s were big right around then and uh, a large part of it could have also been uh that 70s show and just like you know that turn of events whereas like you know, in the mid, in like the 2010s, the 80s were big, but in the early 2000s, 
uh, the 70s were pretty huge, like late 90s, early 2000s. The 70s were kind of coming back in a lot of ways. Yeah, I remember that. I remember <laughs> a, a period of time in high school, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, when mm -hmm. bell bottoms were just like really big. And I was right. just like, really? Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's interesting to see the wheels of fashion and uh, <laughs> and that time period kind of collide back to the, the 90s. It was such a weird time for gaming, too. So it, it kind of fits with what was going on with this game. But the game plot is also kind of taking a lot of inspiration from the Get Smart series, which, again, oh. 60s, 70s, which in itself was like a parody of... James Bond as well. Oh, 100%. Absolutely. I, I loved Get Smart. That Absolutely. One of I my loved favorite it. shows when I was a kid on Nick at Night. Yep, yep. Uh, actually, when I was a kid, the Opal GT that he used to drive, mm. uh, the Buick Opal GT, uh, was like my favorite car. And I wanted that car <laughs> for like so, so long. So, anyways, this game takes place, you know, around that time, and Unity is the group that uh, our main character, Kate, works for. Kate Archer. Archer, yep. Yep. She was an ex-cat burglar, and she was the very first spy who happened to be female working for Unity. And there were some people in Unity that were kind of like, oh, she's an ex-cat burglar. Like, you know, she's not qualified, like that sort of vibe. But mm -hmm. she ends up having to prove her worth, you know, as the game goes on and, you know, ends up going on all these missions and everything. So she really becomes a big, uh, important part of Unity. The bad guys in this, the group is called Harm. So much like in Get Smart, uh, the bad guy's name is like an acronym so it's like h dot a dot r dot m so yeah 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 also inspector gadget Man. yep yeah 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 <laughs> inspector gadget too yeah but kate is actually a really competent and and great spy and you know she uses a lot of like cool techie gadgets that are disguised as like female like di like items like you know um lipstick that's actually an explosive like that sort of thing mm -hmm. so it's pretty clever the game I have not played, but I did actually buy the special edition fairly recently in hopes of potentially reviewing it. Um, and that comes with like the strategy guide and it comes with the soundtrack and everything. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to ripping that soundtrack and really kind of diving in deep to the music after I play the game because uh, I, I really do have a feeling like I'm going to enjoy this one quite a bit. It's first person, so it takes a lot of influence from like games like GoldenEye, and uh, it's kind of ironic because Perfect Dark came out in the same year, in 2000, it came out a couple months prior uh, mm. to that, to uh, to the game. Uh, it also got a port on the PS2, not as good, uh, a lot of, you know, control issues, and they had to, you know, scrap some stuff in the game, so if you're gonna go seek out this game, I think you can actually, don't quote me on this, I think you can get it on GOG, um, and if you can, get it that way if you don't care about physical games um, because that's probably the best way to go about playing the game. Cool Makes stuff. sense. Yeah. Guy Whitmore is the composer on this one. He has done quite a bit, starting off with Shivers in 1995. Mixed up Mother Goose Deluxe in 1995 as well. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to pick a bunch of random games. Uh, he worked on the Blood uh, franchise, Blood in 97, and Blood 2, The Chosen uh, as well. And then after doing uh, The Operative and also the sequel to Operative, uh, he later on worked on games like Two Human in 2008, where he was the senior audio director. He took on a more like audio director lead uh, with a lot of games, but he ended up working on music design and composition in games like Blood Fresh Supply, so he kind of returned to the Blood franchise. And Marvel Iron Man VR is his newest game in 2020. But more famously, probably for Ori and the Will of the Wisps in 2020, where he was the lead audio. Nice, nice. Mm -hmm. Let's move into your next pick here. Cool. I'm down. So this is from a very, 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 very good game. It's called GoldenEye 007, and it came out on the N64 in 1997. This track is called Silo, and it's by one of our favorite composers here at the podcast that we've interviewed twice, Grant Kirkhope. Woo!
We're back. And that track rocked. That was GoldenEye <laughs> 007 that came out in the N64 in 1997. The track was called Silo. It's also known as like Soviet Union uh, Silo Mission. And uh, it's composed by, just as a quick clarification, Grant Kirkhope, Graham Norgate, who might be the actual composer of this track along with Grant Kirkhope, and uh, also Robin Beanland. Uh, I want to clarify, though, Robin Beanland worked on elevator music for this game, not like like the music when you're in the elevators, not specifically the, the entire soundtrack. But it's worth mentioning that uh, Robin Beanland was also part of this on the uh, sound team. Yes, yes. Yeah. This track just rocks, man. I mean, <laughs> I think the thing that really stands out to me the most is that snare drum. That just absolutely pulsing, like, pot, pot, pot. Just <laughs> snappy, punchy snare drum. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I really enjoyed the like the droning bass line that kind of kept this thing moving. Um, was was really cool. Uh, yeah. Not super buzzy, but just groovy enough. The the whole overall feel just had like a real like rock and metal vibe. I mean, a, a lot of the, mm-hmm. the, the music on the soundtrack does, which is one of the reasons that I enjoyed the soundtrack uh, to this sure. game. But uh, towards the end, that like that overdriven guitar instrument that they that they use. Mm-hmm. sounds really fun to me like the effect like you can hear what they were going for and yeah. uh, the the effect that's there isn't quite perfect but it, like i i think that the just the weirdness of it mm-hmm. really adds this like level of fun to the to the track that wasn't really there until like the end where that came in yeah a lot of the guitar stuff was specifically done by Grant Kirkhope for various different rare game soundtracks on the N64. So, like, for example, Perfect Dark, the credits Mm -hmm. theme, uh, the Killer Instinct, gold guitar work was all done by Grant Kirkhope. So it's it's really just kind of a testament to, as we've discussed with him on both the episodes that we were talking to him about, it's really kind of a testament to his guitar playing and his musicianship uh, in various different bands. They 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 clearly were like, "Hey, you you were in a band. Like you were you were a rock god. Like let's uh, let's let's hear your uh, you, let's hear your stuff, man." And you know, except that was you know very American, and he is you know very British. European, yeah. yeah, very British. So it clearly didn't. Uh, come across as that was like you know i don't want to do a british accent because i'm going to butcher it so i'm just going to say that (laughs) we don't want to insult our friends here (laughs) right exactly exactly i love this song and the game soundtrack in in general is just phenomenal it's the and the game is phenomenal i mean how who doesn't like goldeneye (laughs) i i don't know many people who didn't enjoy this game uh when when they were around for it i'm sure many of the kids these days would not enjoy it as much Uh, a remake Wait, didn't they remake this on the Wii or the Wii U? They- sort of. Yeah. They didn't remake it. They kind of were like, let's make another GoldenEye game and just like not remake it. So yeah, yeah. Uh, the closest this game came to a r- proper remake or re-release was uh, an unreleased game that you can actually download that was supposed to come out for, I think, like the original Xbox. Ooh. And that is the closest that... It was either the original Xbox or the 360. I can't remember which, but like... There's so many licensing and copyright issues with this game getting re-released because MGM owns the rights to GoldenEye because, you know, obviously James Bond. Mm -hmm. Microsoft owns Rare, but Nintendo helped produce or publish and produce the game uh, as well. So it's like there's so many hands in the (laughs) honeypot. And from what I understand, like, I think somebody... At the towards the you know they were working on this re-release and I guess like somebody was like nope forget it and the whole thing fell apart. Oof. So it just I feel like this game's never gonna get properly re-released like officially and, yeah. uh, and, and that's a shame. It is. It's yeah. it, it's a huge shame because if you're like me and you have an N64 and this game and you go to try to play it, uh, that you suddenly realize that modern gaming has progressed to the point where. Uh, this game is kind of unplayable. Like I just, I remember spending so much time, uh, yeah, maybe a year or so ago, just trying to like get back into actually playing with that N64 controller and like mm-hmm. how they did first person. Like it's kind of like tank controls and whatever. And it's sure. just, it's so rough. Like at the time, it was great. It was the best mm-hmm. thing that we had ever you know come across for it. Sure. Especially that four player sc- split screen on a on a TV this small and mm-hmm. <laughs> everybody's playing on the like a 
posted a, a postcard sized portion of the screen. Right, right, like a five by seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. I mean, it was just it was so so much fun. Like this was this was one of the greatest party games that we had in high school and college. I've said this time and time again, Perfect Dark was always my jam. Yeah. Uh, GoldenEye, I liked, but the only time I ever really played GoldenEye was uh, when I was in a band and we practiced. I was in a band for a very, very short time and we practiced. And then after we would practice, we would just hang out and play GoldenEye. <laughs> nice. And that was pretty much, it was basically an excuse to get together to play GoldenEye with your friends. <laughs> so uh, that was the only time in which I, I really spent time with uh, GoldenEye. But, you know, I got it years down the road, like later on and ended up enjoying it. it it's a fun game but i i feel like perfect dark is the better game of the two and you know despite the fact that it you know that it suffers from frame rate issues uh the controls are uh in my opinion a little better and uh, have aged a little bit more uh friendly perfect dark got a re-release of course on the 360 and golden i did not so it's kind of one of those things like yeah, they updated the controls or gave you the option to update the controls in the uh, in Perfect Dark with the re-release. And man, Goldeneye could really use something like that these days. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, agreed. For sure. So Robin Beanland on this one, again, just did the elevator music, so not really much to say. And we don't want to, you know, kind of put the spotlight entirely on him for this one. So, you know, go listen to uh, other episodes that we've done where we've covered rare games. We definitely talk about Robin Beanland mm-hmm. quite a bit. Conquer, you know, those types of games. So, yeah. Grant Kirkhope, we've <laughs> interviewed him twice. We did uh, episode 30, which was the Perfect Dark retrospective with him. That was a lot of fun. So if you want to hear more uh, from him about that game, go check out that episode. And then we also interviewed him and David Wise for the Ukulele Evolution episode, where we talked about Donkey Kong Country and Banjo-Kazooie and how those two evolved into uh, ukulele down the road. So if you want more Grant Kirkhope, go check out that one as well. Graham Norgate, he has definitely been talked about by us in the past, as have all the rare composers for the most part. (laughs) Uh, He started off doing music in 94 with Killer Instinct and then did later games like Jet Force Gemini, Perfect Dark. He actually left the company in 2000 and later on worked on Time Splitters, Time Splitters 2. Oh, he was working go. for Free Radical. Yeah. His final game was Tamarin in 2019 where he contributed an, an ambient track to the soundtrack on that one. That is actually a Jet Force Gemini spiritual sequel and it looks super cool but got not so great reviews which is really a bummer because I really need to go play it for myself and determine that. So, <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's move into my next pick here. This is going to be from Alpha Protocol. This came out on the PC, the PS3, and the Xbox 360 all in 2010. The track is Ambush and was composed by Jason Graves and Rod Abernathy. Welcome back from that ambush track that was from Alpha Protocol, the 2010 release on the PC, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360, as it was composed by Jason Graves and Rod Abernathy. I've heard of this game, but I know nothing about it. But musically, I gotta say, 
I was like, yo, you need to chill out, Track. Like, you're coming in real hot. <laughs> very aggressive. Very, was, very aggressive track. It was crazy. And uh, I, I think my favorite parts of this track, you know, it's obviously like a very, like, you got caught, now you have to run away, that sort of thing. But the thing that really kind of stood out to me sound-wise was those error noises where it's like the song was playing and then it's like the DVD skipped or got caught on a part. So it's like, eh, like the error kind of vibes. That was really a nice touch that you don't hear often in this type of music. Like, yeah, like if you played this for me, I'd be like, oh, it's like an action movie thing or, you know, where somebody got caught and they're running away from something and, you know, there's explosions happening and they're getting shot at or whatever. Then they're running away. But like hearing that, those little glitchy kind of vibes to it really spiced up the track for me. Oh, yeah, you're right. I, I really did not notice that. That's so funny because I love stuff like that, and I, I'm <laughs> usually pretty good at picking it up. So good ear, man. Boom, boom. <laughs> That's what's up. So tell but, me about this one. I'm, I'm interested. I have not played Alpha Protocol. I've seen it. I've heard of it. I've heard relatively good things about it. I mean, it got mid to good scores for the most part, but it is uh, an action RPG You'd think most of the games that we're going to talk about today would be stealth games, but looking at the list, there's a pretty good breadth of what we have here. But you play as a character named Michael Thornton, who is a secret agent, and you're traveling around the world taking on these missions, and as you're going through uh, through these things, you're kind of unraveling this conspiracy around you. Hmm. I don't want to spoil too much of the game, because there, there's a lot of sort of like twists and turns in it and it sounds pretty interesting like if i had the time for games like this i would probably want to play it but my main issue is like this feels and looks very like deus ex i don't know if i would compare it to like human revolution although maybe it looks pretty wild and for a game from 2010 it looks really good too yeah Um, i mean this is PS3, Xbox 360 era, so uh, it, it actually falls in line with some of the other stuff that I'm thinking of, but mm. just a, a lot of the screenshots here, it looks really, really nice. Yeah, it's so. weird. Like, review-wise, like, a lot of people gave it pretty low scores, you know, if that's something that you care about as far as, like, the numbers go. Overall, it seems, like, okay. I don't know. These composers, Jason Graves, started out all the way back in the way, way back times of 2003 doing orchestration on The Hobbit. And then did a number of licensed games that I see here, like Star Trek Tactical Assault in 2006, Star Trek Legacy in 2006, did music in both of those. For stark contrast, he also did music composition on Rayman Raving Ravids in 2007. (laughs) Let's jump up a little bit closer to current here. He did the music composition on the Dead Space games. Like, that's yes. what he's known for. Dead Space 1, 2, and 3, I think? Yep. Yeah, I believe we talked about him a bit on the survival horror episode for- with Avalanche Jared in episode 10, I believe it was? Yep. Yeah. Correct. Mm-hmm. So, he, he has done a lot of really cool stuff. Most recently, to, uh, to update from 2019, yeah. his most recent compositions are for the Dark Pictures Anthology Man of Medan in 2019 and the same anthology Little Hope in 2020. Cool. And then Rod Abernathy. I know we've talked uh, a bit about him. He started out doing audio music scoring on Dark Side of the Moon in 1998. And just a, a handful of things in his resume here. Blazing Angels 2, Secret Missions of World War II in 2007. Defendant De Penguin in 2008. <laughs> and uh, aside from Alpha Protocol in 2010, his most recent composition was for Earth Defense Force, Insect Armageddon in 2011. Cool. All right, let's move into a- another female-led game series in the spy espionage style of gameplay. This is Perfect Dark Zero. This came out on the Xbox 360 in 2005. This track is called Rooftops Escape, and it's by David Clinic.
You're, You're listening, listening to XVGM Radio, where the bits just keep coming. Welcome back to the episode. That was Perfect Dark Zero, which came out in the Xbox 360, and that year of release was 2005, so it just hit its 15-year anniversary last year. <laughs> the track was Rooftops Escape, and it was by David Clinic. He's the sole composer on this soundtrack. This was really heavy. It reminded me of something that I'd hear on the radio. Just like all in all, it sounded like just a really cool metal song that didn't have any lyrics that I might hear on, I don't know, The Rock or something like that years ago. Sure. I can see that. Interestingly enough, a lot of the soundtrack did actually have licensed full song music. But you're right that the music in this in the level specifically, largely feels less like video game music in the sense that it's built for video games. It sounds more like music that they created just to be really solid music with solid song structure. Mm -hmm. So this track just changes so much throughout it though. I mean, yeah, you've got that crunchy, heavy, almost like bluesy groove to it where it's like da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. I mean like, that in and of itself was a cool kind of hook. But then you've also got these like Asian elements that kind of come in throughout the track, like maybe around like the midsection of the track that kind of float in. They had like, I don't want to say chimes, but it's like that, the, 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 you know, like, like woodwind chimes or whatever. Really neat touch to the track that kind of made me go, oh, what? There's something else in this track. <laughs> the strings as well in the beginning kind of as a backdrop to that crunchy, heavy section was a really nice touch, and it painted a picture of desperation for me Hmm. for this track. And then I got to say, more towards the end of the track, when it goes back to that groove, but with it, you get these really thumping drums. Even like when the drums are kind of doing their little solo part uh, more towards the end of the song, It felt like a kit. The bass drum felt and sounded like a padded bass drum that you would normally hear in like a heavy metal song, like a Metallica album or maybe like a a garage band kind of sound to it. So it was cool. Uh, It was just like a really fun, energetic track. Yeah, I really liked uh, towards the end when that double bass pedal just kicked in and it just got really, really aggressive. (laughs) That Mm -hmm. was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was cool. And then it just ends with this like, bana, bana. Bana, it like it's a great way for the track to go out. I don't believe that the actual song in game fades out like that, because then it would need to start over, and I don't believe that it does that. So Rooftops Escape, like this level is very agonizing as far as like all the stuff that you have to do. You're essentially covering for your dad. You're playing as Joanna Dark in this one. It's a prequel, and uh, your dad Jack and you are bounty hunters. And so Jack and Joanna kind of accidentally come across this seedy organization sort of thing while they are trying to rescue a client named Ziegler, who's like a researcher, and he's been kidnapped by this uh, Hong Kong triad leader named Killian. Hmm. So what you're doing in this is you are escaping on the rooftops of this stage, and Jack your dad is basically on the ground shooting at all the bad guys and you're on the roof following him and you're taking out all the guards before they can kill Jack. So it's very heart pounding because you've got to do a lot of stuff in a certain amount of time. And sometimes there's no explanation as far as like how to specifically take guys out. So you've got to replay it over and over and over again. But, uh, It's a cool scene, and it's very memorable music that kind of fits with the memorable atmosphere of this game. (laughs) Jury's out as far as the game itself. Some people like it, some people don't. I happen to like it, but there were certain things I didn't like about it. But overall, the controls are a little sluggish as compared to the original Perfect Dark, which moved way faster. This one just kind of feels a little bit more slow, and it's not as good as Perfect Dark for sure but there are some really unique and cool features that this game implemented and uh, some really cool guns too that you can use in this game. But uh, neat game, neat soundtrack. David Clinic is uh, a longtime composer 
kind of contributed to a lot of the earlier stuff, like with the original Perfect Dark. We talked about him a lot on the Perfect Dark episode, episode 30. I guess that was like his first title unofficially. And then he came into his own with Perfect Dark Zero as the primary composer after Grant Kirkhope wasn't working on that one. He also did music and live performances on Conquer Live and Reloaded, cameo elements of power, and did production on Viva Pinata and uh, mixing on Jetpack Refueled. He did quote unquote clanging and banging on Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts <laughs> in 2008. His final game, Connect Sports, in 2010 with Rare. He has not really been seen since. He hasn't done much, so hopefully he's still out there producing some amazing tunes. Yeah, yeah. So my next track here is going to be a sequel to Chris Hart's request. This is going to be The Operative No One Lives Forever 2, which came out on the PC in 2002 and the Mac in 2003. This is the main menu theme, and it was composed by Nathan Grigg and Guy Whitmore. The following ad is intended for Alex Messenger only. Hi, I'm Shannon Jim, proprietor of the Silent Spy Saloon. For 45 years, we've been the exclusive hotspot for fellow spies such as yourself to sneak into for a late night drink. Solid Snake, Sham Fisher, Joanna Dark. Yep, they've all been here. Even got photos on the wall. But with the focus in video games shifting to action over stealth, our time in the shadows has ironically increased in a not-so-fortunate way, which is why we're offering a two-for-one drink special at the Silent Spy Saloon for the next two weeks. Come on down and get by our booby traps so you can make a connection in our bar. Hey there, I'm Action Bob. Don't listen to Silent Jim. The reason why his business has been stuck collecting cobwebs is because he's trapped in the past. Bust down to my little bar and wonders of an explosion. You get not only two drinks for one, but you get to ride a tasty wave on the hood of a car with our beach lava explosion ride. That's right, we got rides here, because we believe in having fun. Now hold on just a dang minute there, Skippy. Your rides have been known to cause lacerations and internal bleeding. Come to the Silent Spy Saloon for a carefree drink and some kind conversations with a few of your fellow favorite spies. If you sneak in without being detected, we'll even throw in a free cardboard coaster to take home for free. Yeah, this guy's giving away coasters. Well, shut the city down. <laughs> oh man, that's rich. Come to the Explosions Bar and get special dances from half the staff. That's right, we're Dance Club now. Pre-order drinks at the door for your favorite dancer and then eat an entire fried chicken while you pound some drinks. Listen, folks, don't listen to Action Bob. Come on down to Charlotte's Sprash Saloon. Don't 
Don't bother with the skis or silly spy games. West open a keg with Chris Redfield and Joe Valentine. We've got free Wi-Fi that's completely VPN encrypted with... Did I mention Duke Nukem was stopping by Friday? Two bars, two polar opposite crowds. Who can draw the most coin? Find out every Tuesday night on Silent Action, the latest reality hit TV show only on VH3. Call your local cable provider for details. Welcome back to XVGM Radio. That was main menu from the operative No One Lives Forever 2, A Spy in Harm's Way. And that came out in the PC in 2002 and the Mac in 2003 and was composed by a combination of Nathan Grigg and Guy Whitmore. I really prefer this track to Chris Hart's and not that I prefer the game or not that I prefer the entire soundtrack or anything like that, but I feel like this one had a lot more going on in it Mm. and it didn't have that throwback like, eh, eh, remember the 70s? You know, sort of (laughs) 60s, 70s. Instead, it kind of was almost like influenced by that music, but not parroting it in a way. There's some really cool elements to this one that I wanted to specifically highlight, like, for example, the uh, xylophone. Those Mm. gentle, like, do, 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 like the xylophone there. And uh, the use of, like, the ticking noises, like the ticking time bomb kind of noises. That was such a really fun touch Hmm. to this track. It's almost like this track kind of speaks in movie vibe in (laughs) in a way, like it's telling a story. Yeah, that's pretty fair, I think. You actually hit all the things that I liked about this as well. Aside from in the beginning and the end, uh, there's just these like Morse code beeps that I I think is what they are. Yeah, yeah. Um, And it's just like another small touch that was just very, very nice. Yeah, it's Morse code or like submarine. I I couldn't pick up on what specifically it was, but that's a good, uh, I totally forgot about it. So good, good ear on that one. (laughs) I like how it fades too. Almost as if it's going around and then coming back. So it's like, and then the, like it goes around, you know, that sort of vibe. It was it was cool. Definitely a good track. Yeah. This game, obviously a sequel to the previous one, takes place a year later, and it focuses on sort of the start of the Cold War. So, I mean, this is still taking place in the 60s, but there's some tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, specifically over a small island. I think it's off the coast of Greece. Mm-hmm. So... You know, there are some new people in charge of, uh, of Unity, and you're still playing as Kate Archer, going, you know, around the world trying to prevent nuclear war or anything crazy happening between the United States and the Soviet Union. And, of course, Harm is there uh, once again to try to make everything worse. <laughs> Pretty much. So uh, I'd, I'd say you're, you're st- sort of standard spy stealth game fair Mm -hmm. and it looks really good this one i don't think actually got ported like the last one got ported to the playstation 2 yes Uh, this one is just microsoft windows and mac os actually both games got re-released with fan-made patches as free downloads it's called the no one lives forever revival project and that was in 2017 so You know, obviously fans cared about these games enough to put together something so that they could be played elsewhere. So I don't know if my copy of No One Lives Forever will actually play, but hopefully, I mean, I got it installed and I got it operational, but I just haven't sat down with it yet. So I'm hoping it's good, as good as it seems, and that I can jump into the sequel and get the sequel as well. Yeah, I mean, it looks like it. Um, it also looks like it keeps some of the uh, some of the, the humor from the first game too. Mm-hmm. So that's always good. I, I enjoy games like th- there's plenty of games that are that are mostly serious that are that are just fine. But I like it when a game can make me laugh, especially in these days when there's not as much to laugh about. <laughs> true, true, true. So as far as the composers go, I mean, we talked about Guy Whitmore when we talked about the first game. So I will just talk about Nathan Grigg here for a short bit. Nathan Grigg started out doing music and sound effects on Sylvester and Tweety and KG Capers in 1994. Hmm. uh, And then went on to do Demolition Man in 1995. He did music and sound on that. Tron 2.0 in 2003. uh, He was music composer on that. I know I've talked about that game before, but I don't think I've talked about it on this show. I think that was part of our crossover episode with Rhythm and Pixels. Uh, yes, yes, I, I played a track from Tron 2.0 on, yes. uh, on, on their show. Yes, yes. So 
that's a great game and that has a great soundtrack. Mm -hmm. And then it looks like he was composer on a bunch of the Fear, F-E-A-R, First Encounter Assault Recon uh, games, starting in 2005, Extraction Point in 2006, Perseus Mandate in 2007, even Fear 2 Reborn and Project Origin in 2009, and the third one in 2011. Oh my. He's done composing for almost all of his stuff. His latest composition was actually Mortal Kombat 11 in 2019. Hmm. Cool. Well, it looks like we are getting a call on our caller request hotline. Janine, go ahead and forward that over. Hopefully it's not a cassette tape. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't look like it this time. Nope. Good. XVGM Radio, you are on the air. Who is this and what can we play for you? This is Snake. Hi. I'd like to request a song. Oh, man, Snake. I'm a big fan. Solid Snake, right? Yeah, whatever. Listen, just play this song. It's from Metal Gear Solid 3, Snake Eater. This came out on the PlayStation 2 in 2004. The track is Surfing Guitar, also known as 147.08. And I'll give you a little hint. Put that in your codec. See ya. Wow. Uh, All right. Thanks, Snake. It's rare we get calls from such famous spies. Yeah. Especially naked ones. <laughs> <laughs> and what a nice. And what a weird track too for him to pick. This song, Surfing Guitar, was composed by Harry Gregson Williams, Norihiko Hibino, Shuichi Kobori, and Nobuko Toda. That was Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater, or Snake Eater, or whatever, you know. (laughs) PS2 release, uh, as came out in 2004. Surfing Guitar was the name of the track. It's also called 147.08, because that is the code that you put in the codec. Thanks, Naked Snake, for that tip. 
Harry Gregson Williams was the composer on this, as well as Norihiko Hibino, Shuichi Kobori, and Nobuko Toda. What did you think of this one? Oh man, this was wild. This is that was not what I was expecting at all. And it's funny because like I heard surfing guitar and was like, okay, this is probably going to be like a surf rock kind of song, and it was, but it's just it's not what I would expect out of a Metal Gear Solid <laughs> game. Oh exactly. my god, it was legitimately a really cool song. I feel like it could have been a little bit more developed and and had some lyrics, and it could have been like something that I would have heard on the radio or something in like the yeah. '90s. Oh. Yeah. Totally like Beach Boys era, you know, surf rock yeah, yeah. kind of stuff. This song plays when you dial into the codec 147.08. It's basically a joke. <laughs> um, it's essentially like you're dialing into a radio station and you end up, you know, catching this song playing. So kind of neat. That's funny. <laughs> nice little Easter egg. Um, Reminds me of a track, uh, I think it's called Miserloo, which is another surf rock song. <laughs> Oh, okay. Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater is a prequel to the other Metal Gear Solid games and just Metal Gear in general. You're playing as Snake's dad, also known as Naked Snake. Hmm. He's trying to rescue a scientist of Russian descent named Nikolai Stepanovich Sokolov. He's also trying to blow up a weapon that they're creating. It's kind of like a prequel to Metal Gear. Mm -hmm. Also, he's trying to take out the boss you fight against various different characters similar to the other Metal Gear Solid games. They all have like specific names and gimmicks to their backstories. Uh, there's a character named the Pain who can control hornets. There's the Sorrow, which is a spirit of a dead medium oh. character. There's the Fury. He's like all geared up. He's got a flamethrower and a jetpack. There's the Fear, who has supernatural flexibility and is super fast. Then there's the end, who's basically like this old, super old sniper dude. It's a cool game, man. I mean, Metal Gear Solid 3 really kind of was like a level up on the gameplay, the storytelling, everything. I don't know. It's cool. If you haven't played Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater, definitely check it out. If you've never played a Metal Gear game, it's basically stealth espionage combat where you're trying to sneak around and you're not trying to get caught. Uh, there is, uh, there's definitely more of an element to that than in other games, I would say. All right, these composers, Harry Gregson Williams, started off with Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty in 2001. They mostly have done the Metal Gear Solid series, doing a lot of original compositions for it. They did other games as well. They did the theme for Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. Most of the games that they're doing music for is these military-esque games this is like the type of music that harry produces so mm. but the more konami aspects of the soundtrack starting with metal gear solid in 2000 that's the first game that composer norihiko hibino worked on again staying with the metal gear series ended up doing zone of enders mm. baktai the sun is in your hand along with the sequel to that wonderful 101 so clearly became a platinum games composer Shuichi Kaburi started off with Threads of Fate in 1999 and then followed it up with Chocobo Racing in 1999. So they started off with Squaresoft and then jumped ship and started working with Konami on the Beatmania franchise. They left Konami after Beatmania 2DX18 Resort Anthem in 2010 and ended up jumping ship to work on The Evil Within 1 and 2 in 2014 and 2017 as audio director. Next up, we have the final composer for this track, Nobuko Toda, who started off with Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater as their first game. And then they continued working on the side story Metal Gear games, such as Metal Gear Acid and Acid 2 in 2004 and 2005. Then actually they jumped ship in 2010 as well and started working on Grasshopper games, titles like Lollipop Chainsaw and mm. Killer is Dead. So doing musical direction on that. The final game was Marvel Iron Man VR, where they're credited for the score. And that was this past year, 2020. Nice. All right. Well, we have two more tracks to go. So my last track is going to be from Spy Hunter, uh, specifically the NES release in 1987. The track is just called Track 9, and it was composed by Henry Nicola Mancini and Naoki Kodaka. Mm -hmm. 
Welcome back. That was track nine from Spy Hunter, the 1987 version of the game that came out in the NES, composed by Henry Nicola Mancini and Naoki Kodaka. This game got like a ton of ports <laughs> all oh, yeah. over the place, mostly on like those 8-bit computer systems that we were talking about earlier. The ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, the ColecoVision, the Apple II, MS-DOS, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the the original game was an arcade game that came out in, I think, 1983. Yeah, like, it's been ported to every... It, it's like Doom. It, it can probably run on 16 <laughs> billion crabs if you need to. But it's kind of ubiquitous, and I mostly chose it because I felt like leaving it off of this episode would be a disservice. <laughs> um, when I think of spy games and espionage games... Well, specifically spy games, Spy Hunter is one of the first things that I think of. And again, it's not an espionage or stealth game in any way. It's a vehicular combat, but it's about spies. <laughs> have you played Super Spy Hunter for the NES? I have You're not. Right I, I, nor have oh. I played Spy <laughs> Hunter 2. So I'm surprised what? that you picked this one over Super Spy Hunter, mostly on a music level, because, yeah, we all know this one. It's like the Peter Gunn theme, you know, from mm. Spy Hunter. Like, you know, I get yeah. it. It's cool. I do really dig all the keyboard runs in this version. It kind of almost bordered on the more like Paperboy 2 Super NES era of like <laughs> Jazz Odyssey mm -hmm. kind of stuff where you've got like these crazy like frantic eccentric notes and then it just like kind of stutters and then it introduces more notes. <laughs> so it, it almost, almost fits that Paperboy mold. But I got to say, listening to this and then listening to Super Spy Hunter's soundtrack, it's like night and day Sunsoft. Sound-wise, yeah. yeah. Like Super Spy Hunter's soundtrack, if you haven't heard it, it is amazing. It is so good. It's classic Sunsoft, Dat Sunsoft bass. It's, yep, yep. So <laughs> if you're looking for more of a Dat Sunsoft bass Spy Hunter game, it's an exclusive sequel to Spy Hunter that only came out on the NES. Yeah, I actually forgot about that game. Mm -hmm. I probably would have gone with that had I remembered, but my my mind went straight to Spy Hunter <laughs> on the NES. I I it's I I have way more nostalgia for this game than than any of the other ones because this is like I had this, I played it a bunch. Mm -hmm. Um I played it until I was tired of playing it, which was usually maybe 10 20 minutes just because like un unless you get a game over this game does not end and i, I never right. realized that as a kid there is no ending to this game right um and i, I remember playing it so often as a kid just trying to beat it because i was like i want to know what happens i want to know what mm -hmm. it is and now now i know nothing there's <laughs> no ending know. it just goes forever 
that's the nice thing about Super Spy Hunter is that Super Spy Hunter does have like story and an ending and everything. So, you know, it's it's not like an endless runner, so to speak. But, you know, again, Spy Hunter is more arcade style. You know what I mean? So you kind of get what you pay for. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and, and like I said earlier, like this came out in the arcades in 1983 and it was a quarter eater and that that's mm-hmm. that's what it was all about um exactly the the track that we played as well sounds very much like the main theme it's it's a it's a very slight permutation on the main spy hunter theme there's only like two actual tracks that appear to be on this soundtrack and there there's other riffs and like little sounds for when you do things but it's like the main theme that we all know and then this one which i like a lot of the little flourishes that they added yeah no, it's it's a cool track. It's just yeah. it's one of those things that's like I'm so accustomed to Sunsoft sound mm-hmm. that if I play a Sunsoft game that doesn't have a dat Sunsoft bass, it's almost like is this really a Sunsoft game like for real? So, it's just <laughs> one of those vibes for me, I guess. I don't know. It's yeah. just like burned into my brain. Like if I play a Sunsoft game on the NES, it's got to have dat Sunsoft bass. Yeah. <laughs> no, that that's fair. I'll do better next time. <laughs> How dare you not do that sunsoft bass no i'm kidding no cool track Uh, again really like those keyboard runs like good stuff yeah 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 so henry nicola mancini started off with this game uh he was uncredited for spy hunter in 1983 and then we have rock and roll racing in 1993 he's credited as peter gunn Spy Hunter 2 in 2003 is the next credit up on his list. And then we go through some like midway arcade treasures. So Mm -hmm. all listed for Peter Gunn theme. Uh, And then we have Disney Infinity in 2013 credited for Condor Man theme. And then throughout the rest of the Disney Infinity permutations, aside from Bayonetta 2 in 2014, his last credit was Disney Infinity 3.0 edition starter pack in 2015, again for Condor Man theme. Then we have Naoki Kodaka. How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, so they started out in 1986 with Dead Zone. They were also uncredited for Spy Hunter in 1987. 1988 for Platoon. They did the music on that. Uh, Afterburner 2 in 1989. Gremlins 2, the new batch in 1990. I-, I feel like we've talked about Naoki Kodaka on the show a handful of times before. So. Mm-hmm. Their most recent credit is from 2017's Blaster Master Zero for music composition and arrangement. Mm -hmm. We're going to end the show with a traditional spy game called Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow. This came out on the Xbox, the PS2, the GameCube, and the PC in 2004. And this track is called Jungle Suspicion. It's by Guy Dubuck and Mark Lessart and Jack Wall. Here we go. Let's listen. All right, that was our last track on our spy espionage episode. 
Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow. That came out on the Xbox, PlayStation 2, GameCube, and PC in 2004. The track is called Jungle Suspicion. It's by Guy Dubuc and Mark Lassa and Jack Wall. Yeah, this is a Ubisoft game or Ubisoft or whatever you want to call them. It's the second game in the Splinter Cell series. Oh, wow, that's early on. Yeah. There's like a million of them. Yeah, there's a bunch. But yeah, this one came out as the sequel. But yeah, no, this track was so frantic and, and crazy. I was really digging it. I love the didgeridoo. Like, so good. When do you get to hear a didgeridoo in video games? Crash Bandicoot, that's about it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> But yeah, the didgeridoo is like really frantic and crazy. And, you know, you've got that like drum and bass kind of like kind of drumming. It's uh, it's cool. It's it's a good ear worm for you and your ears. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Yes. Yeah. No, this one, I, I had no idea what to expect. I haven't played any of the Tom Clancy games. So uh, I'm not even familiar with what the music is. I just assume it sounds like Call of Duty or something. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, it was super frenetic. And I, like I said, I didn't know what to expect, but I definitely didn't expect that. And that was really, really cool. Like, I, I enjoy being surprised like that, especially from when, like, I'm, I'm just assuming that it's going to be some, like, generic, rocky type stuff from, like I said, like Call of Duty or, or, or Modern Warfare or something like that. And then you actually get this just, like, out of left field, really funky thing with a didgeridoo. <laughs> yeah, really nice choice on instrumentation for this one. Mm. Just really solid. This game takes place in 2006, despite the fact that the game was released in 2004. There is this militia known as Dara Dandoa, also known as Blood and Prayer, and it's led by somebody named Suhadi Sadono. And so you are playing as Sam Fisher, who is voiced by Michael Ironside, and you are going after Dara Dandoa. And that is it. There's later on, like, there's a virus, like a smallpox virus that gets released through these biological bombs. And so you've got to, you know, try to stop that and everything. I mean, you know, pretty standard, like, you know, Tom Clancy plot, so to speak. Hmm. So I don't know. They always felt to me like if you took Metal Gear and made it way more serious and not as goofy, you know what I mean? I don't know. To me, like video games, you got to kind of laugh at yourself in a lot of ways. And when a game tries to take itself way too seriously, I'm, I'm kind of turned off by that. And that's kind of how, how I've always viewed the Tom Clancy Splinter Cell games is like super serious military bro games, you know, and I'm like... I don't know. I need a little goofiness in there. I need to, like, find a slice of cheese in a toilet or, like, blow up some aliens, you know? I mean, you know Tom Clancy's a serious book writer, right? Yes, I do. Spy novels. I so. do. I do. I, I know yeah. who Tom Clancy okay. is. It's just <laughs> gameplay-wise with a video game, I always felt like there should be something in there that kind of makes it a little more fun. I also want to mention that Lalo <laughs> Schifrin... Uh, was the composer of the primary theme music for this game who did, like, you know, a bunch of movie-based stuff. A lot of, like, Clint Eastwood stuff, like, old school. So, yeah, that's Lalo Schifrin. But, like, didn't really want to mention it because this track specifically wasn't composed by him. So, Guy, or Guy, only worked on two games, Splinter Cell, Pandora Tomorrow, and Splinter Cell, quote-unquote, Essentials. I don't know if that's, like, a collection or what, but those are the two games. Mark only worked on this game. And Jack Wall has a huge history with video game music. He is one half of the video games live crew with Tommy Tallarico. And he started off doing Vigilance in 1998 as an audio producer. He also did Myst 3 Exile in 2001. Worked on a lot of the Myst games and Mass Effect. He was the composer on lead composer on the Mass Effect series for Mass Effect 1 and Mass Effect 2. I don't see him on here for 3, but I guess not. Final game that he worked on was in 2018, Call of Duty Black Ops 4. Anyways, now is the time of the episode where we pick our favorite tracks. Justin, what do you got? I got nothing. Got nothing? <laughs> they all sucked. No, I'm joking. They were all terrible, uh, especially yours, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had to make a snap decision here. I would probably go with your gold in my track just because, you know, there's some nostalgia tied to it, and, and it is a really rocking track. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. 
I'm gonna give it up to that operative No, no One Lives Forever 2 track. That really surprised me with all the extra kind of things in it that really made it stand out to me. So that is my pick, but I'll go for a second place with Perfect Dark Zero just because of how much is going on in that song and how it constantly is changing and uh, evolving and just a great, great track. Fair enough. Yeah. I feel like GoldenEye is just too good. And it's on its own level. Yeah. You know, yeah. it just can't be touched. So it's like, yeah, <laughs> obviously GoldenEye is the favorite of everybody's, but, you know, <laughs> got to give it up to some other newcomers. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, the listener? Do you agree with Mike? Is GoldenEye untouchable? Or did you have a different favorite track? Let us know anywhere you can reach out to us. Twitter, Facebook, the website, email us. Smoke signals. Stop us on the streets. Tell yes. us. Yes, yes. Or the Discord. Let us know. So we'd like to take a moment to thank our Patreon patrons, without whom this show's continued improvement would be impossible. They are Alex Messenger, Cam Worma, Chris Hart, Dan Lawton, Jordan and Anson Davis, Kung Fu Carlito of the Heroes 3 podcast, Scott McElhone, Chris Myers, Peter Panda, The Autistic Gamer 89, Brad Austin, Chris Murray, Jeremy Rutz, Llama Adam, Marcus Stewart, Nathan Cooper, Nick Davis, and Ryan McPherson. If you would like to become a patron, you can sign up at patreon.com slash xvgmradio. There you can see the different tiers as well. Just $1 gets you a thank you at the end of the show and access to our monthly live shows. You can visit our website, xvgmradio.com, where you can listen to all the episodes and learn more about your hosts, as well as any of our guests or composers that we've had on the show. If you'd like to reach out to us, you can always email us at xvgmradio at gmail.com. If you've liked what you've heard, please consider giving us a review on iTunes. You can join our Facebook group and chat with other VGM lovers at facebook.com slash groups slash XVGM radio, where we talk about everything from current game news to sharing awesome VGM tracks or just talking about the podcast itself. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle on both of those sites is at XVGM radio. If you don't have any other social media or just want to try something unique, check us out on our Discord group chat. Links will be in the show notes. Justin, we're coming back in two weeks, and we're bringing some guests. Who are we bringing, and what are we doing? Oh, man, I am super excited for this. We are bringing back some some friends that we have not spent some time with in quite a long time. Robin Purnell of Rhythm and Pixels are going to join us to talk about Adventure Island versus Wonder Boy. That's right got to draw a line in the sand somebody's got to pick adventure island somebody else has to pick wonder boy who's it going to be find out in two weeks all right we'll see you in two weeks this is mike and justin signing off for xvgm radio the track is called jungle suspicion it's by guy or sorry guy de book or de book or de book de book de book and Mark Lassier, 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 Lassa, Lassa. Okay, and Jack Wall. <laughs> that one's easy. Yep. I could do that one. Yeah, we gotta draw a line in the sand. Somebody's gotta pick Adventure Boy. Somebody's gotta, or yeah, uh, Adventure Boy. <laughs> and Wonder Island. And Wonder Island. Right. <laughs> uh, let me redo that. <laughs>